Okay, it's broadcasting to all attendees. Here we go, seven. Let's count, counting up now. I'm muting. Yep, yeah, maybe just mute yourself. Here we go. Okay, welcome. I'm just welcoming people as you join. I'm just going to wait a couple minutes and then I'll introduce myself. Okay, I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second because I saw a hand going up, but let's have a look here. Already a question. Okay, so I'm gonna leave the, um, you're welcome to, as you join, to enter in any questions that you like. Um, and I will get to those at the end just so that we can start on time. I'm just going to give it uh, three more minutes at 7.05. I will start just noticing people are slowly coming in. Then I will turn on my video and share my screen. There will be a presentation. Again, just welcoming people as you're entering, just so you know somebody's here. Just going to give it a few minutes. There are a lot of people joining tonight before we start our training. All right, so just a couple minutes more. People are still joining before we start.
All right, so hopefully everybody can see both myself as well as the presentation. If someone could just quickly, uh, Elizabeth, you're there, if you can just quickly confirm. Yes, all is good. Thank you, Tammy. Great. Okay, thank you. All right, welcome everybody. And thank you so much for joining me tonight. My name is Talia Charney. I'll introduce myself in a second. Uh, but I would first like to thank Healthy Planet as well as uh, Pure Source, who are both co hosting this wonderful talk on do it yourself household cleaning products that I'm so excited to give. And uh, I'm sure that you're going to enjoy it as well. Just a little bit about me. My name is Talia Charney. I'm the Nutrition and Health Education Manager for Pure Source, and I've got about, you know, 15, 20 so years that I've been in one way or another involved in the health industry as a health educator, doing research. I've written a book called The Confident Food Shopper, uh, The Guide to Food Labels and Fables. Um, and just being intimately involved uh, both as a health coach and, uh, and so on. Uh, more recently, I've got uh, a little bit involved in researching DIY cleaning, but I've always been interested in clean ingredients, and this is just an extension of that. Um, the talk is going to be about one hour, just so that you know. And I'm going to start with kind of an interesting bit of a background on different ingredients that you're going to use for those cleaning products. And then the very bulk of the second half is going to be a lot of different recipes. But I want you to know that uh, you will be emailed this whole presentation with all of the recipes so you can relax and you don't have to take notes. Also, if you have any questions, please type them in where it says Q&A as I go whenever you think of it. And when I get to the end, I will uh, take five minutes or so, try answer as many as I can. I did get a few earlier on today. Um, and if, uh, if I don't answer one of those during it, just prompt me again at the end. Um, I think that's it. So I'm going to jump right in. So when it comes to cleaning products, I want to impart on you the, what I call it, the S-E-E-E. -E -E. You want your cleaning products to be safe. You want them to be environmentally friendly and sustainable. Of course, you want them to be effective as well and economical, so to save money. And, and that's what I think uh, DIY cleaning products can accomplish all of those. So as I always say, safety first. So let's start with that. Now this is a very recent post and I'm sure you've heard of this, people uh, hurting themselves by exposing uh, themselves to a lot of more um, conventional cleaning products because of COVID-19 and a bit of panic around sterilizing and sanitizing. Um, so there's been a 58% increase in poisoning from bleaches and disinfectants and, and hand sanitizers and such. And this just really drives home the point that our cleaning products are not benign and we do really have to think about what we are putting on our surfaces, breathing in our air and so on. And a really great website to delve deep into understanding products and the ingredients for cleaning is the Environmental Working Group. So you can look that up online and all of the references and videos that are referred to and such, by the way, are at the end of this presentation. I have two slides that are just a list of links to many of the videos that I watched that provided great information and many of the great uh, resources online that I found. I had to go through tons of bad um, blogs and bad videos just to find the gems so you have them all there. So not only will you get the recipes, but you can go back and you can watch some of these things be done live. Um, but what I wanted to point out with this particular slide is that a lot of the cleaning products that you probably are familiar with 
like Drano or Lysol, these you know, brand names, Ajax, have received an F grade from the Environmental Working Group, which is the lowest grade possible. And part of that grade is about the uh, problematic um, health implications of these ingredients, whether they you know, cause irritation or toxicity um, or and other things like that. So you can look up your own products on that website. This is just an example of how they evaluate those products. So a product like Easy Off, you can see they break down the ingredients, which typically you can't find on products. You'll, you'll not find all the ingredients because our labeling laws are quite loose in Canada. Uh, but you will see a breakdown of the ingredients and a valuation and a description of uh, what are some of the problems with those specific ingredients. I hope to introduce you to ingredients that will all be A, you know, A, maybe B rated type of ingredients that you can use for all of your cleaning. Some places are luckier than us, like California, where they uh, fairly recently in 2017 had a victory with regards to ingredient disclosure on their products. So companies obligated to disclose all the ingredients on their cleaning products, but that is not the case in Canada. It can be hard to find them all. There are so many products that we use that are unnecessary and that we can just get rid of. And part of that has to do with the fact that we've been, you know, we're brainwashed by a lot of commercials and advertisements that make us think that we need things that we don't. Uh, and the re reality is that um, there's a huge crossover. If you look at uh, different cleaning products that you buy, many of them are very similar, almost identical, but they're just marketed differently. So you're buying, you know, three or four products that are essentially almost the same thing. And that's one way that companies get us to buy more things. Um, but also a lot of them are so much stronger than we need. We don't need industrial strength cleaning products for our households. And I'm particularly wary about things that we spray in the air because they contain uh, chemicals that help those, uh, that help the, the chemicals themselves linger in the air for a long period of time. And, you know, or up to three hours aerosols can. And so that's a, that's a real problem. It's exposing other people long after we're cleaning. I want to start with um, six just safety tips here. I'm guilty of not always wearing protective gloves or protective eyewear or masks. It's just sort of common sense. If you're working with powders, even if they're safe, it doesn't hurt to wear a mask when you're mixing things. Vinegar's safe, but it's not safe when it gets splashed into your eyes. So, um, you know, wearing gloves, often we kind of get lazy and we just do things without gloves. Um, I highlighted a particular brand of gloves there because for years I've bought these awful yellow gloves that are big and bulky and they break and they leak and I found these really nice slimming ones uh, recently so that's why I noted those. And read your labels and instructions on your products and, um, and on the machines that you're using. And of course making your own products to me uh, we still have to be sensible and maybe if you have no experience follow some recipes um, that is a really safe way of cleaning so i'm going to start with the difference between cleaning and sanitizing and disinfecting so i want to talk about that um, cleaning is step number one you don't want to sanitize the surface before it's clean you always have to do that and cleaning is just basically mechanically removing visible soil and that, for the most part, is really all we need to do under normal circumstances in our homes. You don't need to sanitize and disinfect under normal circumstances. We're not in normal circumstances right now. Sanitizing means reducing disease-causing pathogens, and normally restaurants and other places like that would need to sanitize, and that they follow certain public health codes. Uh, disinfecting is a whole other level. So that's killing almost all disease causing pathogens. And normally that's just reserved for hospitals, places like that. We don't need to disinfect or rarely. So disinfecting right now, of course, is something that we're focusing on because of COVID-19 and to prevent the spread of infections and such. But 
under normal conditions, you may use a disinfectant if you have you know, accidents with meat cooking prep, you have raw, raw animal foods, um, if you have an immunocompromised person, um, or of course, points of contact with COVID-19. Um, important again is that you can't disinfect well until you remove grease and dirt. So you always still have to clean. And in order to disinfect properly, there's something called dwell time, which means that you need to let your disinfectant sit for a period of time, which is hard if you're, you're not patient. Can't disinfect uh, you know, instantly. And certainly again, kind of false advertising gives consumers the impression that you can put something on and, and in one second it's immediately disinfected. But it takes a few minutes. Often it has to remain wet, so you might need to reapply the disinfectant that may evaporate. Now a lot of people use chlorine bleach and it is an effective disinfectant, but it's not as safe as others and it's definitely not something that I choose to use. So two much safer disinfectants are alcohol, um, isopropyl alcohol is one that's commonly available, and hydrogen peroxide, um, 3%. And as you can see, you still need to leave them that dwelling time to sit on a surface for a while. Um, you don't actually need to wipe away hydrogen peroxide or alcohol. You do need to wipe away bleach because they naturally evaporate. You might hear about, you know, online and in blogs, other things like tea tree oil or vinegar, um, silver compounds and such, as you might hear them being referred to as disinfectants, but based on uh, Health Canada standards, they're not recognized as those. So if you really need to disinfect for an important reason, um, such as to protect somebody from a surface that may be contaminated, uh, with the virus, then you know, follow the proper standards. Uh, and another important thing to say though, because a situation like this that we're dealing with right now does cause paranoia about microorganisms and makes us feel like we need to sterilize everything and get rid of it. And again, under normal circumstances, um, a sterile environment is not generally, it's not necessary, and it's not good for our immune system. We need to be surrounded, and we normally uh, should be we're covered in microorganisms on our skin. We all have viruses in our body at any one time, and, and um, you know, billions of bacteria in our gut. So we have to remember that a sterile environment is not, not normally a desirable one. And so typically, public experts just recommend normal cleaning, which is, you know, soap and water, washing your hands, and common sense things like separating cutting boards for meat and poultry, and that sort of stuff, and, and proper cooking temperatures. And that's normally all we need. Okay, so now let's get into what kind of supplies uh, might you need in order to do DIY well and easily. So there's many types of supplies that uh, it could be. Uh, one of them is if you're going to do DIY, it's really helpful to have spray bottles. Now you could reuse or upcycle existing cleaning product bottles. If you find something works really well, sprays well, is good, you know, uh, feels good on your hands, easy to use, by all means, keep that and reuse it. What I'm showing you, the, the amber glass spray bottles, if you need other bottles, that's a particular one that, uh, that I have, so I'm showing, and they come with nice, uh, these like chalk labels that you can reuse. Uh, it's got a very comfortable grip and it sprays well and it's good quality. Um, you can find these online. You want them to be darker glass because that just protects the ingredients inside from degrading, especially you know, the essential oils or other things like that. Um, old toothbrushes are very handy for cleaning in little crevices. It's really helpful to have a store caddy, any kind. I have one here. Uh, if cleaning is easier and less onerous, you'll, you're more likely to do it. Squeegee is great because prevention first. So if you don't want mildew 
trying to clean mildew out of your bathroom, the best way is to prevent it from coming in the first place. So after a shower, just to simply squeegee your walls. Uh, and that's what I do. And then you really don't have to do much cleaning at all. Um, you are going to need some cloth. So it can be old t-shirts or cotton. I like um, these Mabu eco-friendly cloths. I've had ones that have been and I've been using them for three years, the same cloth, and keep throwing it in the wash. It shrinks a bit, but works really well. Um, a ringer bucket, and that's because when you're cleaning your floors, one of the mistakes we often make is putting too much water, which just makes the cleaning job harder. Uh, so you want to be able to wring out your um, whatever you're using. Cloths really well. Lint brush can be very helpful. Uh, and a scraper to remove some really tough uh, dirt, so for example, hardened food or burnt uh, bits in your oven. So these are the uh, maybe cloths. I think that they're very common to find in health food stores, so you shouldn't have trouble finding them. A few cleaning tips. So number one is first do no harm. That means use the most gentle method that you need first. And if you maintain your place and you clean frequently, honestly, soap and water is going to do most things and is all you need. I mean, it's going to do the bulk, soap and water and maybe vinegar of your cleaning. Cleaning from top to bottom makes sense, but sometimes we don't do that. So, you know, you don't wanna dust, things fall down, do your floors last. Dwell time is something that's really important because when you're using natural cleaners, they will work, but you're going to have a lot less um, work to do and you don't have to you know, put in a, lot of, um, in a lot of physical effort if you spray your stuff and you let it sit for a while and then come back. Um, also spot testing. So I'm going to suggest some things later on or show you some ways to remove stains. Whatever surfaces you have, if you're using something new, you're getting a stain out of a shirt, spot test first. I ruined a few things while I was experimenting because I ignored that and I didn't spot test. And then there's also certain efficient patterns when it comes to cleaning. One of them is the S pattern. So we're, we're used to seeing this round pattern for cleaning. You often see that if you watch, you know, on TV or such, but uh, all you're doing is you're uh, taking the dirt and you're returning it back to where it was. The S pattern makes more sense. So you want to clean across and downwards and that's more efficient. All right. So um, next I'm going to talk about the cleaning ingredients that will be helpful for you, for you to have on hand. You don't have to have all of these, but I'm going to uh, mention and cover 13 ingredients. Some of them are alkaline and some of them are acidic. So the alkaline ones, washing soda, oxygen bleach, Castile soap, borax, and soap flakes, baking soda. Those are your alkaline ingredients. You have acids and alkaline. Uh, the more alkaline they are, a little bit the stronger they are. And then we have neutral, dish soap and table salt. And then we have our acids. And I'm showing it to you like this because I wanted to have some way to organize what I'm introducing you to. And also because it's interesting uh, to see and there's a lot of overlap. So many of the alkaline ingredients will have the same actions work in similar ways. Um, for example, baking soda and washing soda have a lot in common of what they can do. And then the, there's the acid, so citric acid or vinegar, which is another acid. You'll see tons of recipes online using one or the other, and they're often interchangeable, but I'll speak to a little bit of their differences as well. Oh, and alcohol. So those last three are not acids or um, alkaline. Just a disclaimer that this talk is for informational reasons. Um, don't disregard specific cleaning instructions for your own products or your clothing, your surfaces. Make sure that you do your research. Uh, don't disregard warnings of your particular models of washing machines and dishwashers. And any undesirable results from these recipes are at the user's own risk. Although I'm pretty confident that uh, we shouldn't be too worried. So I'm gonna start with the alkaline cleaners. It's very hot, so. Excuse me, I'll be sipping a little water as I go. Alkaline cleaners. So I'm going to just start with soap. 
Um, so Castile soap is something that I use a lot for cleaning. It's, it's really, soap is key for your all purpose cleaners and it can do so much. It's so ordinary, but it's really extraordinary. And Castile soap specifically is the most gentle soap. And uh, what Castile soap is, is that it comes from a traditional recipe from Spain, from an area called Castile. The original recipe was just olive oil and lye, which we use to make soap. Nowadays, the term Castile is used to represent any vegetable-based soap. And we'll typically say Castile on the bottle. I'm showing you here Dr. Broner's because it's a very popular brand um, and they make a huge variety of Castile liquid soaps. You can also get Castile in the form of soap flakes and soap flakes are very handy to have as well when you want to make dry mixes like a washing, um, you know, for your clothes, a washing powder and I will give you those recipes. Now you can also, if you have Castile soap flakes, you can actually make your own liquid Castile soap. So in theory, you don't have to have both. Here's a fun recipe and the YouTube video, which again is at the end of how to make your own Castile soap. So baking soda and washing soda I'm gonna um, cover next. You can see here that they're very similar. Baking soda, sodium bicarbonate, washing soda, sodium carbonate. They're so similar, in fact, that if you take baking soda and put it um, in the oven and bake it, you can make washing soda. So that's really interesting. Both pretty non-hazardous to the environment. And you can see they have a lot of overlap in terms of what they do. So in order to decide, well, which one should I use for what, um, baking soda is milder and I tend to use it more for, uh, you know, as a gentle abrasive for cleaning, whereas washing soda, I use more for actual washing your clothes. And, and that's, it's commonly going to be in laundry detergent recipes. You're going to see washing soda. Technically, you could use baking soda for that as well. Um, so that's how I see them slightly different. Um, and baking soda has a more of a very thin powdery texture. Washing soda is a little more gritty. There are really endless uses for baking soda. So this is a must ingredient for DIY. It's a great deodorizer. So you sprinkle it onto something that you want to remove the odor, leave it for a while and then remove it by vacuuming. Vacuuming if it's on a pillow or a mattress, wiping if it's in in a trash can or otherwise. Um, it's great as an abrasive and you can make a nice abrasive paste with the recipe I have here. And you can add in any essential oil you like, but I'll review a little bit about essential oils. Of course, baking soda is great to extinguish small fires, but you really have to have it in a marked can ready to go. And I did find an interesting recipe on how to remove yellow nail stains with baking soda, which I've never tried out because I don't paint my nails, but there you go. Washing soda, as I mentioned, is more for, for laundry. It whitens, it brightens, it deodorizes, and it softens hard water. I'll get to what hard water is. It's also used in swimming pools, um, incidentally, because it's very alkaline. So it helps raise the pH. The chlorine uh, doesn't burn our eyes. Um, it can also be used as a deodorizer, just like baking soda, and to remove grease and tough stains. So it's a little bit more, it's a little bit stronger than baking soda um, for that. So if you have to soak grills or pans, you can do that. Borax. So borax is a little more obscure. I'm still kind of trying to get the feel for borax in my life, but I have it. Um, it's sourced from natural mineral deposits and it's composed of sodium and boron. It is, uh, it is very natural. There are some people out there who supplement, you know, put, eat borax a little bit every day to supplement with boron. I don't recommend that, but it just speaks to the fact that it's, you know, it's definitely natural and not dangerous, um, you know, but, but don't, don't eat it. Um, it is, um, 
when you put it in water, it actually produces hydrogen peroxide. So there's a lot of overlap in these different cleaning products that when you take one and you add it to water, it will turn or morph into another one. So hydrogen peroxide I'll be covering um, so it releases hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen peroxide, as you know, people use it to whiten their teeth. So it's a natural bleaching agent and natural deodorizer and sanitizer. Um, it's safe for septic systems. Many people, if you have kids, know about borax because it's used to make slime. Uh, so that is one of its more interesting uses. It's also can be used as a weed killer, as an insect and pet repellent, uh, pest repellent, uh, and a whole bunch of other purposes you can see here. So it's good, another good base ingredient to have on hand because if you're looking for recipes, you will come across many that will have borax in it as well. Let's talk about bleach. So there's the conventional chlorine bleach. It is definitely harmful if ingested. It's harmful with prolonged contact, um, you know, say to your hands or to your skin. And one of the interesting things about bleach, because we think of, well, bleach is going to help white clothes uh, that are stained get white, but actually bleach removes a lot of clothing that look that uh, they look white, but are actually treated with something called optical whiteners. And bleach can remove those optical whiteners and, and actually over time, or even depending on the clothing right away, um, make them less white and damage the fibers and turn them yellow. Also, bleach is dangerous when mixed with other products like vinegar and ammonia, which is probably responsible for some of those statistics you saw about people um, causing themselves great harm recently when trying to disinfect. So why not use a safer uh, bleach? So, and I, and I have this one that you're seeing here. Um, this is called oxygen bleach. And it's different than the bleach that you just saw because it does not have the chlorine in it. Um, so it is not dangerous when mixed with vinegar or such. Um, for short, we call it SPC. And again, when you add it to water, it, it uh, releases hydrogen peroxide and sodium carbonate, which is washing soda. So again, you have one cleaning product turning into other ones, which is really interesting. Um, and this uh, it releases oxygen, which bubbles up and helps to lift stains. The thing about oxygen bleach powder is it doesn't work until it's added into water and it fizzes out. So it's only active for a certain period of time. It can uh, brighten, deodorize, sanitize, and descale. So it's got a lot of uses, again, a lot of overlap. But most people use it for laundry. If you look up online, and I, you can see here, I've got um, the bottom of the page, it says great video. There's a video there that talks about dozens of uses for oxygen bleach. So I'm not covering all of them, nor do I have experience with all of them, but it definitely whitens whites brightens colors, and I'll show you an interesting use I have for it later on removing labels. So it has to be dissolved into hot water to work properly. And it's, as I mentioned, it's only effective when it's wet. So you gotta mix it up on demand and it's only active for about six hours, which means it's not something you're gonna mix up in a bottle and label because it won't work by the time you use it. You have to just use it as you go. And here are some general recipes I've provided you with just to you know, how to use it as a concentrate or to make a large soak um, or to spot clean. You can use different proportions depending on what you're doing. So now let's go from the bases to the acids. So there's citric acid. Um, citric acid, I have it below me here. It's, uh, it's just kind of like a very grainy white powder. It has a lovely scent. Um, it comes from a, one of the common sources, of course, is citrus. And it is great for removing mineral deposits, uh, which a lot of the acids are. Mineral deposits, meaning deposits of calcium or magnesium. I'll get into that. It's also citric acid is used as a preservative in the food industry. Um, in fact, I have a different citric acid, a food grade one that you, I use for sprouting. Some tips when it comes to acids in general. 
you have to be careful with certain counters, stone, marble, brass. So always be careful with acids. And, and this is a common mistake in many recipes, do not mix Castile soap, which is alkaline, with an acid because they neutralize each other and then they don't work. And I did an experiment to test that out. So the uses for citric acid, um, you can use citric acid as you would vinegar in your laundry. Um, so here's just some details on how, if you want to use citric acid instead of vinegar, how you can replace one for the other proportion-wise. As I mentioned, it lifts mineral deposits. I watched a great video comparing vinegar and citric acid for removing rust and citric acid one. So it seemed to work better. So you can think of citric acid if you've got something rusty. One of my favorite recipes with citric acid, and one of my favorite uses is citric acid is really great for, for creating tablets. So when you put a bunch of powdered ingredients together, and you press them and it dries into a hard tablet. So that picture you see there, I have made my own as well of these toilet fizzies that you can use to clean between the cleans. Very simple, you just mix a few dry ingredients. Um, and again, there's a video at the end that will show you how to do that, but you mix the dry ingredients, spray it with a little bit of hydrogen peroxide to create a slight bit of dampness, push it into a silicone tray, and just leave it for a few hours and it hardens. And it's, it's a lovely gift and it's great. And one thing I really love about well, a project like this is um, DIY is not only about saving money or having, you know, being clean for the environment, but it also makes you feel really empowered and accomplished. And it's a great thing to do with kids, to get them to do these things. I never felt pleasure in my life from cleaning till I started making my own products. And every time, you know, I'm picking up my own product that I made, I actually get some pleasure out of doing something that I never did. So I think there's a lot more to doing DIY than just some of those, you know, the basics to save money. Vinegar. So vinegar, of course, everyone knows it's a mainstay of cleaning. You um, you can find different vinegars in the aisles. One is considered um, a cleaning vinegar and the other one a white vinegar that's edible. They're really similar in terms of how acidic they are. So honestly, you can use either of those for cleaning. It doesn't matter, but don't use them both for consuming. Another option which I use is um, an industrial strength vinegar, which is um, much stronger, so it's going to be 20% acetic acid. And that is, uh, like you see, these two products here are examples of vinegars that are five times concentrate. And in case that you land up getting one of these, I created a chart for you so that when you see recipes that call for, you know, regular vinegar, you can um, translate them using. And the reason that I like to have a five time concentrate is that you can always dilute your concentrated vinegar for whatever uses, but you can't concentrate your diluted vinegar. And sometimes having a really concentrated vinegar is helpful. I'll show you an example. Also, it saves on plastic so, and space, so you can get a lot more out of that concentrate by adding water. So here's an example of, um, you can see where a really concentrated vinegar can be great. So cleaning a shower head, putting a fully five times concentrate or maybe diluting it half, half with water, tying it over the shower head and leaving it overnight can really help break out those mineral deposits that may have been um, accumulating there for a long period of time. So think of vinegar as a great substance for alkaline messes, meaning where we have alkaline, so that's again calcium and magnesium and other minerals, deposit. And if you have, which I do, if you have heavy water, that means your water's got a lot of those minerals in it, which may be okay or good for you in terms of uh, you know, drinking, but it's not great uh, for your surfaces because those alkaline uh, substances will deposit and they land up being water stains on your stainless steel, uh, soak scum in your bath, that's partly mineral deposits, it's partly dead skin, it's really icky, 
rust stains. So vinegar is going to help you with all of these. Uh, but you need to first clean with soap and then use the vinegar. Uh, and I like to do them in that order. So you clean to remove the dirt and then you can rinse with vinegar to avoid the soap scum. Of course, um, it's very popular to use vinegar to remove the deposits in, the, in, the, in your coffee pots and kettles, but there are many other uses as well. Uh, so hard water tips. What vinegar does is it suspends these minerals, mineral deposits while you clean so they don't redeposit. Um, but how do you know how much vinegar to use? Uh, depends how hard your water is. Uh, so if you can find out how hard your water is, then you can use this particular formula here to adjust the amount of vinegar you're going to use, uh, whether it's in your laundry, uh, or especially in your laundry, um, where you don't want to have your clothes getting, you can especially tell with your towels over time, they get hard and crusty, that's mineral deposits. And vinegar, for that reason, is considered like a fabric softener alternative. It softens by removing those minerals. You will add it to the rinse cycle when you use vinegar because you don't want to mix your alkaline washing powder with your acidic vinegar. It's going to neutralize it to an extent and make it less effective. So you need to first wash to remove the grime and then rinse with the, the vinegar. Now, if you don't know if your water is hard, and I did this test, here's a fun and easy test where you just basically take Castile soap and add it into a glass of water. If it goes really murky and stays that way, you have hard water, and if it stays clear, you don't. But we don't know the degree, but that's an, an, a fun little test you can do. Drain cleaner. So this is, you've probably heard of it, this is a very common recipe for clogged drains where you have fat or oil or grease, um, the water's not running down. A very common recipe is to take baking soda and then add vinegar and hot water. And of course you get this sort of uh, explosion, or not explosion, but this fizziness. And that's what a lot of people do. And it's all over the internet. But there are some that question, does this really work? Because baking soda is alkaline, vinegar is acidic, acid and base mixed together equals a kind of a, just a dead salt. And so you get this neutral salt, which doesn't do anything. So that's the one side of the story. Some people say this can't possibly work. Others say, well, maybe it's the boiling water because boiling water can loosen stuff. Maybe it's the fizziness that occurs before they neutralize. And that's true if you combine them in a closed container, in a closed area, that pressure will build up as they react and that pressure can push dirt up or help remove grime. Our toilet and such is not, that's not exactly a closed system, but maybe it works a little bit that way. So it's kind of the unsolved mystery, but if you find it works, use it. Here I did, a, this is a picture of my own demo of a common recipe error, which as I mentioned, if you mixed Castile soap, you can see on the left, I mixed in there Castile soap plus uh, vinegar, so acid and something and a base. And what happens is you get the soap clumps up and it doesn't mix very well. If you take an ordinary um, kind of washing dish soap, the dish soaps tend to be more neutral. They're not as alkaline as Castile soap. You don't get that clumping, so you can get away with it. But for the longest time, I was cleaning my floors with Castile soap and vinegar and water, and I kept wondering, why am I getting these clumps of soap? And now I know. So you don't want to do that. I tried the same thing with citric acid and, uh, and Castile soap. Acids and Castile soap don't mix together. Just here are some cautions about vinegar. Um, can irritate you with continuous use. So wear gloves and avoid it on, you know, you got to look in terms of the surfaces you're using it on because vinegar can ruin certain surfaces and gadgets with continued use over time and never mix vinegar with ammonia. A little bit about alcohol. 
Uh, so alcohol can also be used for cleaning. It's very handy as well. One of the great things about alcohol is it's quick drying. It evaporates quickly and therefore you're not going to get water damage. So alcohol can be helpful for things where you really want to avoid water damage like your computers or your cell phones where it evaporates quickly. Because it evaporates quickly, it also um, removes uh, streaks. Uh, so it can be helpful for mirrors. It does disinfect, of course, and we have to be careful it's flammable. Um, so I've got my own, let's see here, I got my own, I mix uh, one part alcohol and three parts water, and I use this to clean my glasses, for example. Um, that way I never have to go out and buy that uh, stuff. Alcohol's many uses, so cleaning dry erase boards is a good one. Those can be really annoying when you can't get those stains off. Preventing car window frost in the winter time is an interesting use as a preventative. Disinfecting, again, your mouse and keyboards and screens and removing spots on the mirrors. And there's some nice videos and articles on that for you. Hydrogen peroxide is really handy to have as well. Now, most of you will be familiar with the uh, type of bottle you see there. That's a 3% hydrogen peroxide that you can usually get at any drugstore. Uh, it's in the dark container for a reason, because when it's exposed to light, it deterior deteriorates quickly. So if you have, and I've got my own hydrogen peroxide here, you want to have it in a dark bottle, keep it in a dark bottle. Um, the reason I have my own is because I made my own from, I have a very strong hydrogen peroxide. This is 35%. Uh, if you have a strong hydrogen peroxide, do not use it at 35%, make sure you dilute it properly. Um, hydrogen peroxide is great for stains, natural stain removal. Uh, so a lot of recipes will include it. And um, you know, for your cleaning your toilets, grout lines, having those yellow grout lines, you can mix baking soda and hydrogen peroxide. A great disinfectant to soak your toothbrushes and other things as well. A little bit about essential oils. Um, essential oils, even though called essential, are not essential for cleaning products, but they can really add to them. It's fun. Uh, having a nice, pleasant smell is great, and they also have their own specific uses. So in the summertime, when I start to see little pesky you know, uh, insects and other things, I will use peppermint. Um, if it's in the winter time or I'm sick, I'll use eucalyptus as a decongestant in my cleaning products, lavender for some calming and so on. Um, I use this uh, one product, Nature Shield, which has a lot of ingredients that it's considered a good uh, disinfectant combination. So essential oils are really nice. Citrus I use a lot too in cleaning, of course. Citrus is known to have degreasing properties. Remember though, with essential oils that they are really concentrated. So it takes 150 citrus rinds just to make this one bottle of lemon citrus essential oil. So never apply them directly to your skin, although this is not today about using them on our bodies, um, and a little goes a long way in your cleaning products. Table salt is another nice ingredient to have, like kosher salt uh, has some uses when it comes to cleaning. And now I'm going to get into the bulk of the recipes in the second half here. So we have a uh, do-it-yourself hand cleanser recipe here. Um, probably all have some by now, but you know, in future it's nice to make your own and that way you can use your own um, essential oils. Now this is just a recipe for a hand cleanser, not necessarily as a official disinfectant, so just to be clear. Hand soap. Uh, so it's really nice to make your own hand soap and very easy. You just need water and Castile soap. Vitamin E is nice because, well, especially now, we're washing our hands so frequently, it causes dryness and cracking. Dry cracking hands create crevices and spaces for, um, you know, for bacteria and viruses to take root. So you want as much as you can not dry out your hands when you're washing them. So having a vitamin E in there, uh, a little bit of a nice oil, almond oil could be another kind of oil. 
And I always love the essential oils in my hand soaps as well. There's many different kinds of all-purpose cleaners. So it could just be simply uh, soap and water for your all-purpose cleaner. Just a little bit goes a long way, you know, like a couple of teaspoons of Castile soap in a whole spray bottle. But here's a recipe with borax um, additionally in Castile soap and then an essential oil of your choice. That could really do most of your stuff. You want to have an all-purpose abrasive uh, scouring powder. None of those commercial ones are just so harsh and so bad for the environment. But just baking soda and borax is all you need. You can put it in a jar and adding a nice um, essential oil. I'm absolutely in love with lime. I could use nothing but lime. I just, I love the smell. Uh, so that would be my, my choice. Um, and then, you know, just mark your, your jars as natural abrasive. So you can take the scouring powder, use it to clean your bathtub. Here's a recipe for a degreaser. So grease, grease is like a you know, oily stuff. Uh, half a cup of that all-purpose scouring powder, which I just showed you, mixed with Castile soap and you make a paste. This is where a toothbrush comes in handy and you can you know, remove grease. Let it sit for a period of time. The longer the better, less work for you afterwards. This is one of my favorite projects that I, I did. So it was removing jar labels. So I like to upcycle. This has included a lot of jars. Um, Sometimes just soaking in boiling water will remove a jar label without anything else, but companies use different kinds of adhesives. So for the more stubborn ones, adding some oxygen bleach powder can really help. Even then you have the odd label that's still got some sticky stuff left or just won't come off. That's where, and this is really super magic, the second or step three comes in. You mix baking soda and a vegetable oil and sort of paint it on that sticker or sticky place, leave it for 20 minutes, and it literally effortlessly comes off like magic. One of my favorite things, I'm just hooked on doing that. Uh, for non-stick cookware, um, and this is a little note from the British Stainless Steel Association, they say that citric acid cleaners are just as effective as harsh chemicals and less hazardous. So here's a recipe with citric acid to remove uh, some of that grime. Furniture polish, you can mix any oil with vinegar or lemon juice. Uh, I like olive oil, but if you're using olive oil, don't make it and leave it for months because it will go rancid. And that's why a lot of recipes use mineral oil because it's more stable, but you just make it in small batches, you're fine. Air fresheners, so again, the, the commercial air fresheners have special chemicals in them to keep the odors in the air longer. And although that has a benefit because they're in the air longer, those things are also not healthy for us. Um, so I definitely prefer to make my own. And really, um, and I'm showing you a particular bottle size that I use here, really a air freshener is just essential oil plus water. But it really helps to add an ingredient that can help those essential oils mix into the water because essential oils are not water soluble, so they will float on the top of the water. Yeah, you can shake before you use it, but ideally you add a little bit of, as it says at the bottom, uh, something a vegetable glycerin or alcohol, and either of those will help the essential oils mix well. Um, so I use this uh, Clean the Air, uh, which has some really nice ingredients uh, that are um, or clear the air that uh, are known to have mucolytic or to, to kind of break up mucus in the lungs so if you're feeling congested. Uh, for automatic dishwasher powder, you can make, I hear this is a, you know, it's, it's maybe hit and miss. I don't have a dishwasher. Um, some people kind of alternate between the regular one and the ones that they make, but definitely um, try and to deodorize your dishwasher. You can also uh, notice the recipe at the bottom with baking soda. So you can use citric acid and borax and washing soda for dishwasher powder. Countertop care, really uh, your all-purpose cleaner of just soap and water is all you need for the most part. But if you need to remove stains on your counter, be careful that you test spot test 
um, or to disinfect as well. Be cautious if you've got marble and surfaces like that, which I don't have in terms of, you know, don't use vinegar or other acids. Um, oven cleaner, good old baking soda works really well, um, making a paste. And a lot of people after leaving the baking soda for a few hours will spray vinegar. We love to see that reaction, uh, whether or not it actually, you know, works or maybe it's just one working and then the other working separately, who knows, but it seems to work. I did a little bit of research for fruit, fruit and veggie washes in terms of what is most effective to remove pesticides. Um, I found finally this consumer reports showing some studies and apparently good old baking soda in water was the most effective out of many natural washes to remove pesticides uh, soaking for 15 minutes. So um, that, you know, it can't get cheaper and easier than that. Clothing stains. So clothing stains, whoops, mindful of the time, I'm getting to the end. The cloning stains are, um, it's complicated and I can't say I have tons of experience, but I've got some great resources for you. Um, and some tips here. So firstly, you wanna, the first thing you wanna do when you get a stain is deal with it right away and remove excess stain. So take a nice, um, a knife or an edge and remove, you don't wanna start rubbing and then you're gonna push the stain in. Blot, don't rub because you want to, again, pick up a stain. Use a white rag because you might land up transferring colors from the rag you're using to your clothing. When in doubt, use cold water because hot water can set stains, but it depends on the type of stain. The goal is to get 80% of the stain gone before laundering. So even if it's not all gone, often once you launder your clothes, it is gone. So don't aim for perfection. Hang dry, if that stain is not gone yet, do not throw it in the dryer. The dryer drying machine will set that stain and then it's very hard to get out. So if you launder it and the stain is still slightly there, repeat, maybe try a different method and then launder it again. Uh, you wanna push stains away. So when you get a, a, you know, a, st a stain, if it's on the top of the fabric here, you wanna turn it upside down and then uh, you could, for example, run water this way. So you wanna push the stain away rather than into the clothing. There's no one best stain remover. It depends on the type and you wanna spot test. So those are the general tips for stains. Here are a few good websites um, and this was a great video and, and this very nerdy gentleman, but in the best way when I say nerdy, described how different stains, whether they're organic, inorganic, oily organic or oily inorganic, uh, required different types of uh, products, oxygen bleach, rubbing alcohol, depending on the type of stain. That was a really helpful video to watch. This is a great chart that you can print up on Molly Maid's website that goes through a lot of different types of stains and gives you this, uh, you know, really detailed removal methods. It's color coded, that's also great to have. And the Cleaning Institute as well had just pages of these very specific, you could click on ketchup or lipstick or, and so on and get the details um, about how to make your own cleaning products. I tried out a couple myself. Um, actually, sorry, this one I didn't try because I don't have sweat stains, but I watched a lot of videos to make sure that I found something that was consistent and demonstrated by different people. So for sweat stains, one, avoid antiperspirants. They uh, make the sweat stains uh, occur more readily. Um, Dr. Mist, Mist and baking soda based um, uh, anti, or not antiperspirants, but um, deodorants are ones that people in the past have told me work well for those who really need something stronger, but that's natural. And the recipes you can see here that works well is just dish washing liquid and hydrogen peroxide and baking soda. And I'm pretty confident this will work um, all the time. This one I did try out berry stains. I, I took a piece of cloth and I stained it. So berry stains work well with just being flushed with hot water. Um, they can either be boiled in hot water, but a common technique is to take the, the shirt or whatever it is with an elastic and put it over a pot so that it's nice and taut 
and then pour hot water from up above um, in the direction of the opposite to the stain. And that seemed to remove berry stains, even the toughest ones um, most of the time. Laundry soap recipe. So this laundry soap recipe is one that I use and I've been using for a long time and it's great. The only thing I would say is I think this recipe was not created for high efficiency uh, laundry machines. So when you see a lot of natural recipes online, um, always try less. Sometimes they're, they're older recipes and they're not created for those machines and they have too much soap in them. You don't need a lot of soap for high efficiency machines. So I, I would just try, um, it says to add half a cup to your load and I only use a quarter a cup because I have a high efficiency machine. Alternatives to drying sheets. So drying sheets will contain chemicals. Um, alternatives are the what they call drying balls and there's different kinds. My experience is with these particular uh, wool balls that are made in Canada. I love them. I add essential oils on them. And um, drying bowls will work well. Now they're not as effective for removing static as are the drying sheets, but the drying sheets do not help uh, increase or do not help decrease drying time where the drying bowls do because they create more space. And so they will, by allowing you to use, um, to shorten a period of time, they will save you a lot of money over time and the environment. So, you know, static is not the worst things. I mean, they do help a bit. Um, if you want to make your own drying sheets, you can watch this YouTube video and you can do that with uh, cutting out your own little kind of cloths made with flannel sheet or cotton and dipping them in vinegar and some type of essential oil and you can make your own drying sheets. I have not tested this out, however. Toilet bowl cleaner. Very simple, and if you have really tough stains, like ring around stains because of the area you live in, maybe the water, I, I, one of my colleagues has um, up at her cottage, she said it gets really bad, use a pumice stone, and she described it as magic, removing the stains. Uh, removing stains from tubs, tiles, and grout cleaners. Here's a recipe. Window cleaner is really simple vinegar and water, but cornstarch helps reduce the streaking and you can add in an essential oil as well. For your floors, depends on the kind of floor you have, but I mean, usually just either vinegar and water or Castile soap and water is all you need uh, and an essential oil. For hardwood floors, just use a very gentle Castile soap and nothing else. Uh, for wooden cutting boards, here's a, there's a great video and here's some details on how to maintain them on a daily basis, weekly basis, and maybe on a monthly basis. Um, and soap and water is typically all you need, but you can disinfect them with salt and lemon um, and you can oil them. I've never oiled mine in 10 years and it's fine, but... Cleaning silver tarnish, this recipe really works. Um, so it involves aluminum foil, baking soda, and salt, and it's, it's great. It, it really helps. Just avoid it with patina design because it might remove some of the accents. This is, as I mentioned at the end, where you get a lot of great resources, so you can go look these up. Many of the videos that I watched, again, for the 20 or so videos I'm showing here, I probably watched more like 100 and just whittled it down to the really good ones. Thank you so much uh, for listening. That's the end. And I'm going to look forward to looking at all of your questions. All right. So let me just take a sip of water here. Um, first, actually, I want to answer a question that someone sent me earlier today before I forget. Um, so the person asked, if I remember, they asked a specific question about the um, now essential oils. The question was, um, they said the now essential oils are relatively inexpensive as compared to some others. Um, why is that? Is it because they're not pure? So that's, I wanted just to answer that question first. So um, the now essential oils are 100% pure when they say it, which is almost all of them. They say 100% pure, but there are some of them 
because they're very expensive, like rose or jasmine that are not, and they say it right on. So in this jasmine one, it says 7.5% essential oil. But for the most part, you know, like 99% of them are pure. The reason they're inexpensive is nothing to do with purity, it's certainly nothing to do with quality. Um, their testing methods are very transparent, are all on the NOW website. Um, the reason that they're inexpensive is that NOW is a very big company. Uh, it's 50 years old, family owned, and they have great purchasing power. So for lavender oil, for example, they purchase more lavender oil than all the essential oil companies in North America, if not globally combined. So um, they also have 50 years of relationships with uh, their, where they, they buy. And so they get priority uh, being again, a large company. So for these various reasons, they're able to bring uh, the price point down. So hopefully that answers your question about that. Uh, wow, okay, so let me look through here. Um, okay, just some uh, excitement um, expressed and hello from different places, Niagara Falls. Okay, sorry guys. Uh, Talia, it's Elizabeth. Hi, yeah. Hi. If you go into the Q&A button, we have all the questions in there. And I believe the first question is, are the oils and cleaning methods oh. safe? Oh, okay. There we go. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Oh, okay. There's not too many here. I was reading all the comments in another area. Uh, so are the oils and cleaning methods safe for pets? Um, so there's many different ingredients that I covered. So I have to be careful about generalizing uh, and it also depends on the pets. You have to always be, even with natural stuff, you have to be mindful and cautious about pets or kids. Kids, they also you know, are, are walking or crawling on the ground. Um, so no, all essential oils are definitely not safe for animals or children. You need to be uh, careful and read up or consult when it comes to essential oils, if you're going to be uh, spraying them all over or putting them all over your floor, depends on the pet. So, you know, birds are very sensitive to scents and don't have a good detoxification abilities. Um, you know, that's the term canary in the, in the coal mine. And it may depend on the type of pet as well. So, yes, yeah, something like so baking soda, yes, is generically very safe. Um, but I'm not, you know, I can't speak to every single ingredient. Natural cleaning products are bound to be safer for anybody um, than, you know, whether it's pets or children or people generally than commercial ones, which can be, you know, highly toxic. Uh, but you still need to be uh, reasonable and do a bit of research. So unfortunately, I can't give you a specific answer because there's so many ingredients, so many different cleaning products and different animals and the circumstances. Um, we do have on the NOW website, um, I wish I had the, the link in, I think actually, sorry, I think in the, um, on one of my slides, let me have a look here. I think on the last slide that, I, that I'm sending out to you, one of them has a link to essential oils and pets. I think it does. So you can look on the NOW website and there is some information about a specific essential oils and pets. So hopefully that will answer um, some of the questions you have. Uh, what ecological formulation of laundry detergent would you propose? Um, so I already gave a recipe for a laundry detergent. So that's in there. I think that I answered that. Um, that was with the baking soda and wash, or sorry, washing soda, borax uh, mixture. Uh, okay, that's done. What eco-friendly fabric softener formulation would you recommend? So for fabric softener, what I had already recommended was um, you can use vinegar or citric acid. Those are fabric softeners because our fabrics get hardened 
by the mineral deposits. Um, so you can use those uh, in your washing machine. Also, not mixing um, towels with other kinds of fabrics because having these very harsh, coarse fabrics with your clothes can actually cause damage to your clothes over time. So um, separating those harsher fabrics from the finer ones can also help keep them softer. Okay, let's see. Um, I had to pick up the phone, I missed 10 minutes. My question is, the answer at the end if you can. <laughs> Sorry, just reading this out aloud. Um, do you have any natural recommendations to remove mold? I understand that prevention is best. Um, yeah, mold is a, certainly a trickier area. I did try to, to find information for mold. If you have bad mold, definitely get a professional because it's dangerous. And absolutely, yes, prevention is best. I'm not an expert in mold. I mean, I had a little bit of mold um, and, I, and I used full strength hydrogen peroxide, which could ruin a surface. It did seem to work, but it's sometimes hard, uh, hard to say, um, you know, if it's not visible, whether it is there or not. Um, I would say, you know, for me, because I'm not an, an expert with mold, I would say the prevention, prevention would be the best and call professional if you're concerned, especially if you're getting any kind of respiratory issues or uh, irritation. Do you use tap water, distilled water, or previously boiled water when mixing solutions? So I just use ordinary tap water, um, I guess, because tap water is hard that um, with a lot of minerals that if you have distilled water may be helpful, uh, but you don't want to be buying in plastic bottles distilled water. Um, so uh, rather than that, you could use a water filter, which you might have anyway, a solid carbon block water filter in your kitchen can remove some of the minerals. So as long as you're not going out and buying it in plastic, but honestly, just plain old water works uh works fine so i don't think you need to use anything special i plan to use oxygen bleach to remove stains in the bathtub is hydrogen peroxide safe on metal um i don't think that uh oxygen bleach or hydrogen peroxide are necessary for a bathtub. Um, seems like a little bit harsh, but it depends on your bathtub as well, because there's acrylic, there's different types of a bathtub material. So um, find out what the material is for your bathtub and then uh, consult the, you know, the maker or the manual um, because it's going to differ. For stainless steel, I just recommend um, vinegar and water or soap uh, to be on the safe side, but I haven't tested those out. So uh, are the toilet fizzies enough to clean the toilet or just freshen it up? I mean, it depends. Um, you certainly won't have to clean your toilet as often and you really just have to check. So it's gonna depend on you know, personal habits, how many people are using the toilet and such. Uh, it doesn't, the fizzies are just working at the bottom. They don't clean around the top part because they don't reach there. So you might still need to clean around the top. Um, another tip about the toilet, by the way, is before you're using any cleaners is to use your um, plunger to get the water to all go down. Because often when we clean the toilet at the bottom, it's still got the water there. So we're not actually contacting the surface and we're diluting our cleaner. So that's a little tip. But I'd say the toilet fizzies will, um, you probably don't have to clean the bottom of the toilet, but you still have to get to the top. Uh, what are the best hand bar soap? Hand bar soap for pregnant um, women. Um, I think Castile, an unscented Castile is, um, you can get the unscented Castile bar of soap as well. Should be your best bet. It's just very clean and simple. Uh, when taking out a stain, is it better to put the shirt inside out or not? Uh, yes, uh, well, it depends on which side the stain is, but yes, the stain is, 
pretty much always on the outside. So you could, uh, on the outside, so you could turn it inside out. You're going to, again, if you're going to be running water, you're going to do it on the opposite side to the stain. So you'll have to turn it inside out. It's good to turn your clothes inside out anyway, when you're gonna launder them, it just protects them and it protects the fabrics on the outside from wearing out. So uh, yes, turn them inside out. Now essential oils food grade. Uh, I'm glad you asked that question. So no essential oils in Canada that come in a bottle like this legally can be marketed for eating. Um, so it's a sort of a irrelevant question um, in the sense that that's it's just not not legal. It is has nothing to do with the quality of the oil, or whether or not in theory it could be ingested. So, for example, um, let's say we had a peppermint essential oil. That peppermint essential oil could be used to make a peppermint chocolate or something that's ingestible. That would be considered food grade because Health Canada has designated it in that form. You cannot have a product that is both uh, marketed as essential oil like this and a food. There are two different categories. And so anyone who's saying that their essential oils are food grade um, are just really not, um, they're not following the, the legalities of the laws for essential oils. Um, and, you know, yes, you, for someone who knows how to use them, the difference is not one in quality, it's in dilution because these are marketed to consumers and not safely diluting them can cause uh, a lot of health issues and be dangerous. Uh, that is why Health Canada separates those categories. I hope that answered the question. Uh, well, it's me, Elizabeth, again. Uh -huh. I questions that came in earlier and I just thought I would jump in and ask you the questions. Uh, one okay. question comes from Ellen Pickett, and she's okay. asking, can the baking soda recipe for cleaning oven interiors be used in self-cleaning ovens? She, say, she states that it turns out that the self-clean function on her KitchenAid convection oven, um, I guess it kills or renders the thermostat neutral, and um, thus I, I'm believing that the um, self-cleaning option can't be used. Well, I don't see why not, but I don't have a self-cleaning oven. And, you know, again, I've done a few weeks of research to put this all together, but I by no means know everything about every uh, different um, type of not only product, but um, of the ovens or floors and things that, that different people have. So. In my mind, I can't say why not, but I would still check with your manufacturer just in case there's something that I don't know about the self-cleaning oven. Um, but, you know, I can't think of any reason why it would be an issue, but just to make sure because I don't want to ruin your oven. Um, Another question? Yeah, oh, sure. And then we can go back to the list. Thank you very much for letting me interject. We have <laughs> no a question from Jackie P. And she states, good evening. How do you use peppermint essential oil for insects? Do you spray pure peppermint, peppermint oil directly in areas that insects crawl around? Question mark. Oh, that's a great question. Well, uh, I've done both. So if I, if I don't actually have a problem that I just want to prevent, then I'll put a few drops of peppermint oil, like say 10 uh, drops of the essential oil in my whole bucket of uh, water and soap that I'm going to clean my floors and that's it. But if I'm noticing some bugs and I want something more concentrated, then I'll use more of a sort of like a little bottle like this, fill it up with water and then maybe put 30 drops of essential oil. So it's more concentrated and, and sprayed around and be more targeted in areas where I think maybe they can you know, get through. It could be very strong smelling, but I don't mind it. Uh, and also for, uh, for ants, by the way, if the ants are the issue, there's a lot of um, recipes online using the borax, borax and I think in sugar. So that's very helpful. 
That was the, that was the questions that I had uh, separate of the question and answer period. So you can go back. Oh, I can go on. Thank okay. you so much for letting me interject. Oh, no problem. What would be a substitute for pine sole? Pine, I don't, you know, I, I've never honestly bought um, commercial cleaning products. Pine sole, I think, is, is to um, polish wood, right? If I, I'm, I'm saying this to Elizabeth because she can speak to me, so I think it is. It's actually sort of a all-purpose cleaner, um, heavily scented, um, that's supposed to degrease, cut, clean. It's supposed to be your, your all, your floor washing, um, greasy messes, that sort of thing. So it's a degreaser, okay. Basically, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what's in pine soul, but the best degreaser is good old boring soap. And, you know, if you have a lot of grease, um, you know, you can use more concentrated and diluted, yes, but um, soap is a great degreaser. Sometimes, you know, you've got to put a little, but if you have, um, you can also pre-treat an area if you've got a lot of grease by spraying the full strength um, vinegar. So, for example, in my, my windows, inside kind of the window sills, there was a lot of uh, hard to get to kind of grease and grime in the corners. Uh, I sprayed full strength vinegar and I could just kind of see it coming away. The, the acid just was eating away at, uh, at that grease and then I wiped it away and then I used soap afterwards. So you could try, but again, uh, you need to spot test with acids because you can't use them on everything. Um, but really just the soap is a great degreaser. Um, also using baking soda and soap because if it's really thick grease, you might need a little bit of an abrasive in addition to the soap, which lifts grease. So those are some ideas. Uh, what do you suggest to clean granite and marble? So granite and marble, just soap and water. I mean, that's what I think uh, most manufacturers recommend, uh, nothing else. Where'd you purchase the brown glass spray bottles? Um, I don't think I put that in the end, but I just, I did get these off Amazon. I hate to say that, but yeah. I mean, if I could get them somewhere locally right now, I would. Um, the brand, this is lots of different ones on Amazon. Any recipes for gentle laundry detergent for wool and silks? Um, I don't have wool and silks. Um, now you, you don't want to use any of the, you want to be careful with stain removers, I know for those. Um, for wool and silk, maybe just Castile soap and water because you're going to hand wash them, should be fine. I'm, I'm assuming that you're not throwing them into the washing machine. Um, baking soda is more gentle than washing soda for those really fine fabrics. So if you need to do kind of a soak, you can use baking soda um, and then maybe the Castile soap separately. There may be other ways, again, look online. I didn't look into any detail into those types of fabrics. Uh, now, parks are open. What do you recommend as a preventative measure for kids? Preventative measure for kids or post playtime? So I don't really understand that question about the parks and preventative measures for kids. I'm not sure what it is, so please resubmit that. Um, now Nature Shield oil, is that a mixture and clear the air oil? Uh, these are not new and yes, they're mixtures. So they have four or five ingredients. I think clear the air has uh, eucalyptus and hyssop and other essential oils that are Eucalyptus is something you might, you know, do inhalation um, with a diffuser when you're, when you're feeling sick and congested. So both of them are combinations. Nature Shield has got uh, cinnamon and, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't even remember off the top of my head, but I can grab it and have it. But yeah, it's a, it's a mixture. Nature Shield is um, usually used as a, you don't have to exclusively use it for cleaning, but most people use it for that. Um, it's based on the same combination as a famous com um, essential oil combination called Thieves. So we answered that. Um, 
Another question about peppermint for insects. So I think I answered that already. Will scrubbing the counter with just soap and water be enough to kill coronavirus? Um, well, soap can kill the coronavirus, soap and water. We know that because that's mostly recommended for our hands. Um, so in theory, yes. Um, but I mean, I guess it depends because for our hands, it's, it's one area and it's 20 seconds. Um, so I don't think that it, that necessarily having some diluted soap um, over a whole surface is necessarily, it's not the same as when we're using a sanitizer. Um, but I did, you know, I did hear a doctor online recommending for surface cleaning for sanitizing using soap and water. So yes, soap does break up the, the virus and can kill it. But, you know, it depends on time of contact and amount and such. So I, that's all I use around my place because I'm careful. Uh, I don't use any strong sanitizers. I can't say more than that. I got to be careful about that. <laughs> um, I didn't see that last one that was just deleted. So it, it, uh, it was asking about the PowerPoint. It's fine. Thank okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the answer is... Uh, so someone's commenting that soap is not enough for surfaces. Soap is not a disinfectant, but soap does kill the coronavirus. That's why we use it on our hands. But again, I can't speak to as to exactly the instructions on how to use it on surfaces because I haven't received that or seen it uh, specifically. Okay, and another comment. So let's just say, I'm just going to say no for the soap on surfaces and killing the coronavirus because I, because again, I cannot provide the specific instructions or know that it's actually going to be effective. Um, so you can consult the websites like the World Health Organization or CDC or Health Canada to get more specifics on that. And that looks like the end of the questions. I think so. Correct. I'm going to jump in one more time, Talia, if you don't sure. mind. Sure. Yeah. Um, just to let everyone know, we will be running a raffle. Uh, we'll be taking names. They'll go into a hat and Healthy Planet will tell us which three lucky attendees will receive a bottle, a full-size bottle of the, um, the Simply Clean Vinegar Plus, a full-size bottle of the Now Brand Solutions Essential Oil Nature Shield, and a box of Borax. So we'll be, and we'll directly send that out to you uh, through Healthy Planet. So thank you so much 